Hi, I'm Mike Larson and I'm from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And this is Dr. John David Smith at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. And we're here to talk about Dear Delia, the Civil War papers of Captain Henry F. Young, 7th Wisconsin Infantry. What brought us together was he's the brains behind the operation. No, no, au, au contraire. <laughs> I'm actually his aide de camp. <laughs> And we're, we're delighted to be here tonight at the Milwaukee Club to speak on behalf of the letters of Captain Young, who I've grown to believe that was almost a brother figure to me, even though he passed away a long time ago, well over a century ago. And we will illuminate his life and his times throughout the letters tonight. Captain Young's uh, letters and our uh, annotations, I think, uh, as a historian of, of 43 years, are really important because they suggest insights not only into the military history of Captain Young and the seven uh, Wisconsin volunteer infantry, but also the social, intellectual, culture, cultural, and gender side of the American Civil War. These letters suggest the constant longing between the Iron Brigade fighting in the East and the Wisconsin home front. So aside from just the military side, there's strong and pivotal information about the cultural life of a soldier from Wisconsin. Okay, and then where, where do you get the book from? Oh yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah. Our book is available in excellent bookstores everywhere, but principally from the University of Wisconsin Press, our publisher. Well, tonight, uh, John David Smith and Michael Larson will be bringing to us a Iron Brigade story, 7th Wisconsin story, the 135 letters of Henry F. Young to his wife, Delia. Together, Smith and Larson have edited the book of such letters, brand new book right over here, printed, came out this month, and they're for sale. I'm sure they wouldn't mind you buying some. Uh, Mr. Larson first found these letters about 30 years ago when he was a, an undergrad at uh, UW Eau Claire and he was in the Wisconsin Historical Society looking around and he, he found them. Mr. Smith, uh, he's published like about 29 books. So they got together somehow and they brought this out. It's not Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones, but uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Larson will substitute a Scandinavian for the Welsh person. So, come on down. Well, I'm almost short enough for this microphone, so it should work just fine. Uh, good evening, I'm Mike Larson, and I'm a history teacher in the school district of Menominee area in Menominee, Wisconsin. For those of you in the southeast part of the state, that would be roughly one hour east of the Twin Cities, uh, if you're not quite aware. I actually live in Eau Claire. Um, thank you very much for having us tonight. Dr. John David Smith and I wish to uh, give you a thank you for the excellent opportunity to speak about our dear Delia the Civil War Letters of Captain Henry F. Young, 7th Wisconsin Infantry. Uh, as was stated, I received my undergraduate degree from the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, a little later on a master's degree from Eau Claire, and I've spent more or less my entire high school teaching career teaching U.S. history, uh, especially from the Revolutionary Era through the Civil War. On occasion, they give me the opportunity to do a course in Global Studies, and Lord knows there's enough going on in the world to keep me more than busy during this spring semester this year. I live, eat, breathe, and die history, as I tell my students. I love it, I like to immerse myself in it, and there's nothing more important, I guess, to me than to see that light bulb go off in a 17-year-old when they maybe finally understand that it, there's something more than them in the world. So, um, it, it's really what's driving me each and every day. I have done a number of things throughout the years. I've attended a number of Gilder Lemon Institutes of American History, uh, Mount Vernon Teacher Institute, the Freedoms Foundation of Valley Forge, 
And for um, the 2017-2018 school year, I was a fellow at George Washington and Mount Vernon. Um, my publications, which are somewhat limited, include a few articles in a book called Teaching Lincoln, and I've also published a few things in a reading in the content area book, the WAML uh, journal, which is published right here in Wisconsin. Dr. Smith is the Charles H. Stone Distinguished Professor of History at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. A Brooklyn, New York native, he studied Southern and Civil War history with the eminent historian Charles P. Rowland at the University of Kentucky. Smith has lectured throughout the world and published more than 150 scholarly articles and 30 books, including An Old Creek for the New South, Pro-Slavery Ideology and Historiography, 1865 to 1918, Slavery, Race, and the American History, Black Judas, William Hannibal Thomas and the American Negro, Black Soldiers in Blue, Lincoln and the U.S. Colored Troops, Soldiering for Freedom, and a Just and Lasting Peace. This project really did originate when I was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. Undergraduates at that time, and I'm not quite so sure today how they work it, but we were required to do a, a history research project, uh, original research, research that involved digging our hands into the primary resources. I was always a Civil War buff, and I really wanted to do something on the Iron Brigade, which interested me greatly at that time as a fairly young and naive 18-year-old. And I searched as, uh, as closely as I could, and it turned out that a company from Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, which is just a neighbor to the north of Eau Claire, uh, Company A was predominantly uh, in the 7th Wisconsin. And as I did a little bit of research, the, the only bad thing about it was there was just not any primary research available for Company A. So I broadened this out a little bit, and quite literally, I stumbled on the letters of Captain Henry Falls Young. And when I looked at those letters, and even at that time, as a roughly 21, 22 year old, I discovered something that I thought would be really interesting for the future. Well, two decades later, I transcribed each letter and then eventually submitted the documentary edition for possible publication to the University of Wisconsin Press. While they might have been impressed with me, which I doubt, um, they thought and welcomed the addition of a co-editor, Dr. Smith. He's, by the way, the real brain behind the operation here. I'm just up front at the moment. My first thought was, I do not want to make a fool out of myself before such an eminent historian. I still feel that way. Uh, very few people can keep me captivated 24-7, and he's one of them. Um, while I did not know it at the time, this was really truly a life-altering experience for me. Dr. Smith, who I admire much, was a fantastic fit for our project. He brought to the table a wealth of experience, and more importantly, expertise that the project uh, really needed at that time. I might have done some of the legwork, but it needed something more than what I could provide, and Dr. Smith was that person. I have gained a, I have gained a great friend in the process of our work together. Henry Falls Young was born on September 23, 1824, in the western Pennsylvania town of Newcastle. Unfortunately, we don't know a whole lot about his early life. We know that roughly in the year 1850, he made his way to Wisconsin, where for a while he worked on riverboats. This work undoubtedly put him into contact with his future father-in-law, Jared Warner. Warner at the time operated a mill in northern Grant County, a, uh, a lumber mill. And in 1852, Young took a job at the princely salary of $13 a month. At some point, likely early in his employment, his attention turned to Warner's young daughter, Delia. They exchanged vows not too long afterwards on March 1st, 1853, beginning a marriage that would span nearly 50 years. In the late 1850s, Warner and Young purchased a mill which was at the time still under construction near Cassville, Wisconsin. As I was talking with John earlier, anyone who's from Southwest Wisconsin would know that Cassville 
there's a lot of small towns in old Grant County. Um, the mill was actually halfway between Casville and then basically Lancaster, which at the time would have been the thriving community of the town, population 1,000. Today, probably 15. The outbreak of hostilities in 1861 brought the 38-year-old Young into the service. Young, perhaps because he helped train some of the local men from nearby Cassville, was elected as an officer, which at that time was known as the Lancaster Union Guards, soon to become Company F, 7th Wisconsin Infantry. After training at Camp Randall in Madison, the regiment was sent to Washington, D.C., where eventually they will join the 2nd and 6th Wisconsin and 19th Indiana. As any of you Iron Brigade uh, scholars know, uh, of course, later on they added the 24th Michigan. In early 1862, Young was uh, selected, as he more or less said, to go on detached service with McDowell's uh, Construction Corps. He rejoined the regiment just after the second battle of Bull Run and participated in the battles of Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Bristow, Mine Run, the Wilderness, the Assault on Petersburg, the Crater, and his final campaign uh, before his leaving the regiment was at Weldon Railroad. Captain Young, on hearing of the death of his young daughter, Laura, sought his release from the service after faithfully serving over three years. When Young returned home, he resumed his superintendence of the mill. In 1878, perhaps tiring of the mill, maybe in an effort to be closer, for Delia to be closer to her father, they moved to Jared's farm, which was just north of Patch Grove in Grant County, Wisconsin. A debilitating stroke in 1894 left Captain Young an invalid. And by 1900, probably in an effort to make him more comfortable, they moved to the nearby village of Bloomington. During the Civil War, Bloomington was uh, known as Tafton at the time. On February 5, 1902, at the age of 77, Captain Young heard the tattoo beat once more. Delia lived for another 22 years, passing away in 1924. His surviving children, May and Harry, lived until 1941 and 1944, respectively. Harry, uh, who will be the last of his children, uh, was married to a, a neighbor girl. They had one child, but unfortunately that child died before the turn of the 20th century, leaving no direct descendants of Captain Young and his family today. When Harry passed away in 1944, so ended the direct line of Captain Young. I want to add my thanks for this uh, very nice invitation to come before this, this distinguished Civil War Roundtable. In November 1861, Second Lieutenant Young wrote, I would rather spend the last drop of blood I have and let my wife and children have the free government of the United States to live in and to have our government broken up. His letters to Delia and to Jared Warner, Young often mentioned duty family and patriotism. These were among his core values. He was more than willing to sacrifice his life if necessary to suppress the Confederate rebellion 900 miles away. Young's letters make clear why and how he fought to keep the Union intact. They emphasize his emerging sense of community pride, duty, loyalty, nationalism, and intense patriotism. Serving in the military also signified a citizen's right and a citizen's responsibility. Beyond these qualities, the correspondence in our book documents the volunteer soldier's life, his connections with home and with comrades. They underscore the meanings of courage and the brutal realities of war. What Walt Whitman termed the black infernal background of countless minor schemes of what he termed the secession war. Young's insights, often poignant and, and powerful, enable readers to witness the Civil War as he did. 
Few topics avoided Young's careful eye. Bluntly honest with his emotions and his opinions, he left little doubt as to where he stood on the questions of the day. His correspondence, candid, contemplative, thorough, and occasionally humorous, provides a clear window into everyday events, as well as into war, society, and politics. Young's letters reveal the perspective of an officer from America's Western heartland. The ideas and thoughts of Midwesterners, also then known as Westerners, provide a regional perspective underrepresented in Civil War documentary editing projects and collections that focus on the northern states. No doubt, Midwestern recruits shared many characteristics with soldiers who came from the northeastern and border states. Their regiments, and even more so, the companies in which they served, were what one historian has termed extensions of the community that sent them to war. As such, they were closely watched and worried over. Soldiers like Young believed that they represented their communities, their communities' interests and values, always conscious of their connections and obligations to home especially in the soldier's moral conduct and physical courage. To a certain degree, then, the Civil War soldier was away from home without being truly away. Westerners tended to come from local communities comprised of a mixed population of Northerners and Southerners in a way that people from the states of the Northeast and South could not claim. For them, in the Civil War and their military service in suppressing the slaveholders' rebellion took on a special meaning, becoming, according to two historians, the central event of Midwestern history, but also, and this is important, a nationalizing experience as the soldiers became part of the nation in action and came to know men from other regions and backgrounds. Young's correspondence covers many topics during the first three years of the Civil War, including innumerable details of his business affairs on the home front and wartime inflation. From newspapers, he retained a firm grasp of Wisconsin, as well as national politics. In his letters, Young often remarked on reports of graft and corruption, and he offered pointed opinions regarding the controversial 1864 presidential election between, as you know, President Abraham Lincoln and the Democratic candidate George B. McClellan. Young agreed with Lincoln that, in this contest, it was not best to swap horses while crossing the river. Dear Delia further contained gossip and information about other enlistees from Young's rural Wisconsin community who served in his unit, Company F. Above all, Young's communications highlight his unflagging patriotism, his fierce determination to preserve the Union no matter the cost. Significantly, Young's letters also illumine how the men in Company F retained their community ties. In his opinion, their conduct in the field reflected its community values back home. In his correspondence, Young described how his compatriots trusted each other based on long-standing shared communal ideas and experiences, especially pertaining to such mid-19th century values as bravery, courage, personal and family honor, idealism, manliness, and pride. Like many of his time and place, he sought to be a stalwart man. Young often expressed his antipathy towards men he judged to be dishonorable and unmanly, cowards, war profiteers, slackers, and traitors. He frequently aimed barbs at northern newspaper editors, whom he judged had criticized unfairly at a safe distance from the conflagration of war, both the Army's leadership and its rank and file. 
Jan's devotion to family and place, his wife Delia and his young children at home, runs through his letters, capturing the heartfelt concerns of a young husband and father, separated from his loved ones by the war. Repeatedly, Young expressed his loneliness and his desire to return home, and offered advice for his wife in advising their children. Having done so, he nevertheless repeatedly underscored his commitment to his role as an officer and his determination to stay the course until the Union Army proved victorious in restoring the Union. In his letters, Young also frequently addressed his concern for providing for his family and honoring his financial obligations to Jared, his father-in-law, and other business associates back home in Wisconsin. Readers will find Young as conscientious in meeting his familial and financial obligations as he was in serving the Union Army, even after experiencing three years of war, weariness, and personal sacrifice. And in all, Young showed that wartime service made him, like many soldiers, more aware of the obligations, his obligations, to be a man, steady, strong, principled, and caring. Having to explain the war to his dear Delia and others, and to himself, forced Young ponder his place in a world bigger than the one he left back home in Wisconsin. Like soldiers in other wars across time and space, Young held thoughts of home, family, and friends most dear. In his letters to his wife, he addressed the most minute details of life, instructing Delia which crops to plant, how to manage their finances in his absence how to raise their children, and how she could claim his back pay and pension should he die in combat. And typical of war letters of this type, Young complained about the paucity of details about life back home, about his rations. He yearned for what he termed Wisconsin vegetables, about the infrequent visits from the regimental paymaster, about his family's finances and property, and predictably, he complained, like all of us, about the weather, especially the Virginia mud and damp ground that worsened his chronic rheumatism. Ever mindful of his financial obligations, Young fretted constantly and obsessively over the sawmill he operated with his father-in-law back home, over honoring the debts he owed to merchants back home in Grant County, Wisconsin, and over conducting business and the vagaries of sending money back home on a regular basis. Young also possessed a dry-as-dust sense of humor and was unafraid of poking fun at himself, of reprimanding others, including his father-in-law, if the situation warranted it. In May 1864, for example, Young wrote Jared about having not changed his clothes, including his undergarments, in 35 days. Talk about being lousy and dirty. Oh, ye gods, he quipped. Later that month, writing from Petersburg, Virginia, the trenches at Petersburg, Young informed his father-in-law that, I feel fine this morning, for be it known that I got a clean shirt and drawers on yesterday the second change I have had since the 3rd of May. And I not only shed my duty clothing, but I sent off a good crop of lice with them. Young predicted, however, that by the following day, I will have a new and more hungry set, for the whole country down here is covered with them. Upon learning that Delia had enjoyed a pleasant 4th of July up here in Wisconsin, Henry joked that for him and his men in the trenches, the holiday was anything but festive. Rather, it was as dull as a Quaker meeting. Writing to Delia during an unusually cold October in Virginia, Henry complained that he had to share his scant bedding with his bedfellow, Captain George S. Hoyt of Company K. Young said, 
It was so chilly that I devilish, devilish near froze last night. And every time I waked up cold, my mind would wander off to Wisconsin, to where I had a good bed and a bed fellow that don't go out on the picket. Young's letters to Delia and her father reveal a man unafraid of sharing his innermost thoughts, often sharply and directly, on the men and measures of his day, including insightful and often harsh assessments of famous Union and Confederate leaders. Also, Henry, like many of his peers throughout the North, stated clearly, stated clearly that they were fighting to suppress the Southern Rebellion and to keep the Union intact, not to free the South's four million slaves. On December 23, 1861, for example, he explained to father-in-law Jared, we are fighting to crush out rebellion, not for the abolition of slavery. And every man of common sense knows that as the army advance, the slaves of every rebel will be set free. And what is the use of their forever harping on this question in Congress? It does us more harm than 50,000 men in the rebel army could possibly do. The fact is, I wish those agitators of slavery were placed in the ranks to fight. I think that would cure their radical ideas. Young, like many Yankee volunteers, thus was slow, slow to consider the rebels' rebellion as a war of black liberation. In early November 1862, weeks after Lincoln, as you know, issued his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, Young informed Delia that he had no intention of commanding black troops because he considered them, and these are quotes, the infernal set of cowards in the world. We can't trust them as ambulance drivers or ammunition drivers, or in fact, anywhere that there is danger. And I would not fight with them for the same reason. It is not on account of their color, Young said, but on account of their cowardice. There are exceptions, but they are rare, Young said. The great majority of them, referring to African Americans, would prefer to be slaves rather than fight for their liberty. Still, at times, Henry seemed to favor emancipation. On September 26, 1862, as you all know, four days after Mr. Lincoln issued his preliminary emancipation edict, Henry, then stationed near Sharpsburg, Maryland, asked his father-in-law, what do you think of old Abe's proclamation? It take well with the army here. Now the Rebs will have to die, dog, or eat the hatchet. That's a good phrase. While young, I gotta use that one in class. <laughs> well, sorry. While young remained uncertain how Confederates would respond to Lincoln's emancipation decree, he considered it, quote, just what was wanted. Young insisted that if the rebels don't lay down their arms, we will have to annihilate them, his word, niggers, cotton, and all. Cognizant that emancipation would lead temporarily to what Young called hard times for white Southerners, he informed Delia that Lincoln's proclamation, nevertheless, notice how he's changed, that Lincoln's proclamation, nevertheless, was a positive step and one, in Henry's words, that would forever settle the everlasting slavery question. In early March, 1863, Young asked Ilya a rhetorical question, and like many men, then answered it. What do I think of the Nagar, he asked. Now, I say, arm and equip them, giving them the same pay and all the rights and privileges of white soldiers with the same rewards of America. And if there is any fight in them, let us have the benefit of it. Young added, let the loyal people of every section, of every color, of every political party raise in their might, bury their party strife, and come to the support of the administration. And we will end this monstrous, 
rebellion this coming summer. For the most part, Young remained fairly healthy uh, amid a sea of disease throughout the Civil War. And in 1863, his condition at that time, one of the rare occasions that he was ill, was severe enough that he sought help from the regimental surgeon. While he went to great lengths to ensure a speedy recovery, he was doubtful that the remedy and the prevailing medical doctrine of the day would help cure him. On September 21st, 1863, he stated to Delia that, in this there's one thing certain. I won't take the medicines the surgeons have here and then lay out on the damp ground. I applied for medicine some days ago and they gave me 20 grains of blue max. For Young, the key to getting healthy was eating right, staying dry, and in his case, not taking the blue mass that was prescribed by the physician of the regiment. He did well to avoid blue mass. A concoction that contained mercury, among other debilitating drugs, to help cure an all too common camp malady, diarrhea. Throughout the war, even after the devastating defeats at Second Bull Run and Fredericksburg, Young presented a positive attitude that was not always necessarily shared by his campmates. Writing to Delia three weeks after Chancellorsville, Young shared his view that we are all in good spirits. We soldiers are not like your citizens. We never get excited or elated about anything except when we are charging the enemy. So you can see we are not affected with every blast of hot and cold as you are. The aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg brought several changes to the old and dear Iron Brigade. Being decimated on the first day, they needed a little bit of bolstering. They will add a regiment of New York sharpshooters, and later on they'll add a regiment of Pennsylvania soldiers as well. However, in the fall of that year, one bright spot for the old Iron Brigade was a material justification for their sacrifices on the battlefield. Writing to Jared on September 21st of that year, Young displayed a great deal of pride when he stated, the flag is the most costly and beautiful I ever seen. It was a free gift from our admirers in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Michigan. It was a flag actually commissioned by Tiffany's and presented by the uh, agent from Wisconsin, Y.A. Selleck, uh, while the troops were stationed in Virginia. Throughout the war, Captain Young was not afraid to share his absolute contempt with officers who, in his opinion, were unfit for command. One early target was the first colonel of the 7th Wisconsin, Joseph Van Dor. One trait that frustrated Young and many brother officers was that Colonel Van Dor can't command Americans. He can't explain anything that we can understand. And since he's been drilling in Hardy's tactics, he is worse. He gets the movements and the commands mixed up so all hell can't tell what he's driving at. Then he gets mad as thunder and bellows like a mad bull and abuses all the officers for not anticipating his damn Dutch command. When word reached the men that Van Dor was leaving, Young could scarcely hide his delight and was among many men who were ready to celebrate. He went, out to just, he went on to describe how on the night we succeeded in driving old Colonel Van Dor away from the regiment, we had a high old time. And many of the officers, perhaps myself amongst the rest, drank more than we ought to. But none of us got so drunk as not to know our duties. Young experienced the Second Battle of Bull Run from the vantage point of McDowell's Construction Corps. However, even on detached service, he witnessed firsthand the mismanagement of Second Bull Run. The outcome left Young with a bitter taste over the federal leadership during the battle, yet he had nothing but praise for the men who fought. I have seen many brave fellows bite the dust the last three weeks. Our men, with few exceptions, fought well, but Polk was outgeneraled at every turn, and Jackson's men fight like devils. Six days later, he went on to say, there's no use disguising the truth. 
We were completely out general at every turn, and General Polk and McDonald, McDowell excuse me, are completely played out. In many cases, Young was fairly perceptive in his observations, especially Union leadership. However, in at least one instance, he was in the minority of his assessment of Captain, or excuse me, General John Gibbon, the second commander of the Iron Brigade. After Gibbon changed commands, Young commented, it has come to light that General Gibbon used us harder than was necessary by throwing his brigade in advance and then refusing support when it was offered by another general. His disdain towards senior officers reached a low point at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Writing just four days after the carnage, Young's vehemence reached a crescendo when he wrote, I won't try to describe to you the perfect contempt I feel for the man or men that run us into such a place as we have just got out of. Got out of, did I say? Yes, but there are thousands of brave fellows that did not get out, that were sacrificed and butchered. This is perhaps treason, but I can't help it, for it is the truth. The first commander of the Company F was John B. Callis, a lawyer from Lancaster, Wisconsin and not necessarily well liked by Young or some of the other men in the company as well. Young offered his opinion of Callis when he stated that Callis is not popular with the regiment. He was not popular at home and never will be anywhere else either. However, Young recognized who was in charge and while he may not have liked Callis, he understood the importance of their relationship in the company. And he went on to say, he and I always get along first rate. I do the work, he puts on the style, and it suits us both. <laughs> Callis departed the company in early 1863 for the regimental field and staff of the 7th Wisconsin, a opening that opened up the command of Company F to Captain Young. Callis, who was severely wounded during the Battle of Gettysburg, faced a very, very long convalescence, and later on, when the officers of the regiment got together, they put together a letter and was sent to the Wisconsin State Journal in which they signed a letter of support for Captain Callis, which in some, to some extent was a, a, a little puzzling on behalf of the fact that Callis and Young didn't always see eye to eye. Similar to many men in the early days of the war, Young backed the leadership of General George McClellan. As the war progressed, Young, as he pointed out more than once in his letters, was for the man who would lead the Union to victory. When McClellan ran on the Democratic ticket for president in 1864, Young summed up his feelings in a short parable. Little Mac, poor fellow, puts me in the mind of a lady's little dog. She used to take him and sit him in his lap and pat him. Oh, you're a nice little dog, a pretty little dog, but you can never be a big dog. Any lingering doubt of who the soldier would vote for in the 1864 presidential election was quickly resolved when it became apparent to the men in Company F that the Confederate soldiers, upon hearing that McClellan had been nominated, cheered and paved the way for Young to write I heard a soldier that was out on the line swear that he yet believed Mac to be a true and loyal man. And he had intended to vote for him. But, said he, I'll be damned if I vote for any man the rest will fight for. Any romantic illusion of warfare vanished when Young witnessed his first casualties after the Battle of Cedar Mountain in August of 1862. The shock of death on the battlefield was evident in a letter when he stated, you can never know the horrors of the battlefield. The excitement of battle wears off after it is over. And when it comes to going out and burying the dead by the hundred after they've lain in the sun for three or four days. Writing to his father-in-law after Fredericksburg, Young expressed the view that if they thought to scare us or make us run, they missed it for we formed our lines of battle in the ditches where we could lie down in no comfortable condition, I admit, 
But when a man has to choose between laying in a ditch half full of water or getting his head blown off, he will generally lay contented in the mud. According to a historian Reed Mitchell, soldiers over the course of the war went through a transformation, uh, a hardening to the death and violence. This hardening was clearly evident later when Young wrote, I got off with a mere scratch on the sole of my right foot, but there was one shell that came so close to me that it took the heads of the two men in front of me, scattering their brain all over my clothes. This hardening to death and violence surfaced again in a July 26, 1863 letter to Delia. Young described the rush of adrenaline that overtook him and many other fellow soldiers near the moment of truth, a feeling he admits was difficult to explain, much less to express to his wife. It was an awful spectacle. Oh, the devil, I will quit. I can't convey any idea of it, nor the feeling it produced. Why, Delia, at that time, I would have thrown myself into the thickest of the fight with a pleasure, a sort of fierce demonic pleasure, I admit. But it was the awful stake we were fighting for that made me feel so. For let me tell you, that four-hour fight decided the fate of our great republic. During a brief lull in the Overland campaign, Young, whose sense of humor uh, I, I've really grown to appreciate more and more and more over the years, basically said, I am alive yet, and as the saying is, we're two or three dead men. Similar to soldiers in all wars, there was a nagging question of death. Throughout his correspondence, it was evident that Delia had serious doubts that he would return alive, and worse yet, what she should do in his absence. His straightforward response might have left Delia scratching her head with the seemingly callous attitude. Shortly after Second Bull Run, he wrote, you ask what you should do if I should be killed. It is a hard question, but I have seen so many men killed and died in the last weeks that I will give you the best advice I can. If I should be killed in battle or die while in the service, you as the wife of a first lieutenant can draw from the government $17 per month for five years, which is $204 per year. A few weeks later, after Antietam, he advised Delia that it did not help to worry about his fate. He assured her to take things cool. Don't fret yourself to death, for it will do no good. For we are all creatures of circumstance over which we have no control and your fretting about me getting killed won't help the matter. Captain Young was a dutiful husband, father, business partner, and company commander. Few words better capture the sentiments of some of his men for their captain than his former charge, Lauren G. Parsons. He fervently wished to rekindle those nostalgic moments now fading with time after the war, and without a hint of embarrassment, Parsons told his former commander his true sentiments when he closed the letter, with much love for my honored captain, I remain as ever yours to command. Henry Young endured the hardships of war because of his ideological and patriotic commitment to ensuring that the Republic would survive the rebellion so that Delia and his children would enjoy the fruits of American democracy. Writing to Delia in January 1863, he explained, "'Tis the thought of dear loved home that keeps me up. Was it not for the loved ones there and the pictures of them that I continually build in my imagination? Little would I care what became of me. These thoughts, Young insisted, kept his words, his honor unsullied. He admitted, it nerves my heart to perform my duties, but it, it makes me just and honorable with those that are under my command. For never will wife or child of mine have cause to be other than proud of their husband or father while an officer in the federal government. Henry believed that for all its brutal horrors and destruction, the war nonetheless 
accomplish an essential purpose, saving the nation and establishing degrees of understanding and resolution, yes, between Northerners and Southerners. Ultimately, the crucible of a brother's war altered all participants, transforming the meaning of the Union from an assemblage of plural states into the nation, a unitary whole, one certainly not without racial and sectional prejudices, but yes, one finally liberated from the manacles of chattel slavery. Following his service at Gettysburg, while on picket duty on the south side of Virginia's Rappahannock River, Henry reflected on conversations he heard between Yankee and rebel pickets, separated by only 200 yards. He concluded, the stories of the North and South could not live peaceably is all nonsense. The war has changed the opinions of the masses of the South. They knew nothing of the character of the people of the North. They were led to believe the people of the North were everything that was low, cowardly, and mean. But the war has taught them better. Their leaders will never fool them again. Not only did the war redefine sectional boundaries and identities, it restored the Union, emancipated and then militarized African Americans, and reconstituted the government on a more democratic basis. In December 1864, Henry Young thus looked forward to returning to dear Wisconsin. He eagerly sought to reunite with his family, to celebrate what he assumed would be a long overdue Union victory, and to find his way in the reunited Union, a new nation, quite literally, the United States of America. Thank you. Uh, is he was 
I always feel, one of the things that drew me to Young more than anything else, I swear that if he was sitting next to me right now, uh, we would be having a great time. He really truly was no different than any of us right here. He just lived in a different period. And he was as normal as normal could be. Uh, and he liked to have a good time, which often put him into uh, Van Gore early on. But one of the things that really agonized, I'm sure, Young, was that Van Door, when they were in Camp Randall, took an oath of temperance. <laughs> um, that didn't set so well with some of the Wisconsin boys, particularly Young. Young was, uh, I think that he was fond of his drink on occasion. Um, and being a typical husband, I always tell this to my friends all the time, uh, they, they, they're never quite, I'll phrase it as delicately as I can, they're never quite as honest as they should be with their wives as far as what they've been doing half the night. And so Young will tell, in one classic example, when he was elected, I, I believe when he uh, became captain, he basically said, yes, we, we had a good time, but you know, I, I, I behave myself. Um, one of the soldiers in the company uh, was William Ray, and Ray wrote something a little bit different to that. He described Young as being very, very tight that night, which was Civil War slang for, let's just say he drank too much. And there was a little bit of a scare while they were there, and they had to, they had to report to the, the divisional commander, and Ray was like, I don't even know how those guys go. He said the only reason that they were able to basically make it to that spot is because they were leaning on each other to get there. And fortunately, it was only a scare and, and no real uh, issue that had developed. Now, Mike wanted to include all this temperance business in our presentation. Tonight, and I said no, that it might upset the Wisconsinites yeah. in the audience. <laughs> they didn't want to hear about drink. So obviously, being a North Carolina United, know what I was talking about. <laughs> I think that one of, just one more example of that is towards the end of the war, uh, one of his good friends, Bill Tremblay, visits him, and Tremblay bought a, a bottle of basically Old Back 40, which was probably rock cut commissary whiskey. And I think one of my favorite things, which just illustrates that Young is He's, he's similar to all of us. He said, Bill and I, we've toasted a lot of things, and the more we've toasted, the happier we got, basically. <laughs> and he said, alcohol. It'll make a general a private, and a private a general. <laughs> he said, alcohol, the great equalizer. <laughs> and that's 1864, I thought, yes, I think I know him. One more question, Mark. Did he have any comments, just a policy, about the Southern He thought that they were misled, misdirected. Uh, you heard what I had to say in my assessment you know, on the race question. So he obviously wasn't all that different from most Americans, North and South, certainly going up to 1863. He shared the same biases. But he was national. And I would argue that had a lot to do with his Midwestern uh, focus, the, the idea of fighting for the country that the grandfathers and the fathers had held in May, and it was wrong. You could disagree, but you don't destroy the country. So he felt, and I mentioned it in one of the uh, quotes that I mentioned earlier, um, you can do a lot of things, but you don't destroy the Union. And that we really war cut at the same fabric, the warp and woof of the fabric of America, and that the threads had become undone because of poor leadership. And he didn't fight for abolition. He fought to put the country together. And the, the Southerners, this was a common argument uh, early in the Civil War, had just had bad leaders. They were traitors. Jefferson Davis had been Secretary of War, as you know, under Franklin Pierce. And the, the dope-faced Democrats sort of massaged the South along from the North. So Young was a nationalist. He never lost that. He started it, and he came out with it. I think one of my other favorite comments early on in the war that uh, he, he, old Abe had just reviewed the troops and his comment was, old Abe is not as homely as people say he is. <laughs> He'll live to see Jeff Davis hang yet. 
And I always think, wow, what a what a statement. You know, if, if he only knew. And that, that would have been in the fall of 1861 when he stated that. It was early on when he was, you know, he still thought he'd be home for Christmas almost. Like everyone yeah. at that point. You all know that. They all thought it was going to be over within two months. And, and the Confederates said the same thing. So it's an interesting uh, disillusion. I don't know if you can relate to that about people going to war thinking it's going to turn out one way. A simple, easy little war, right? What Walter Millis referred to as the Spanish American War is this splendid little war. It's almost a non sequitur. How can you have a splendid little war? So, gentlemen, uh, we have certificates for each of you Michael J. Larson and John David Smith. Uh, by order of the General Staff of the Civil War Roundtable in Milwaukee, this award is presented to each one. For furthering our understanding of the crisis, causes, and consequences of the American Civil War, the watershed events in our nation's history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 